Hello and welcome to worship for this 11th Sunday after Pentecost. I'm Pastor Carrie Jonas. I serve as interim lead pastor at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, a church of the ELCA in La Crescent, Minnesota. For the next two weeks, worship online will look a little different. Our director of music ministry is on vacation. So it will be more of a service of the word. So wherever you are watching this, take a moment to prepare your heart, your mind, your focus on God, the reason we worship. We begin this service in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, our defender, storms rage around us and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair, deliver your sons and daughters from fear, and preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. On Mount Horeb, God appeared to Moses with typical signs of God's presence, things like earthquake, wind, and fire. But in this reading, Elijah experiences God in sheer silence. And in that silence, God assures Elijah that he is not the only faithful believer. 7,000 Israelites are still loyal. So God instructed Elijah to anoint two men as kings and to anoint Elijah as his own successor. Let us hear the word of God. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the Lord of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they are seeking my, my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram, and you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elijah, son of Shapra and Abel Morah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu shall kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elijah shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Here he ends the first reading. The second reading is from Romans chapter 10. A right relationship with God is not something we achieve by heroic efforts. It is a gift we receive in proclamation, proclamation that is in the word, deed, and presence, and whose content is Jesus Christ. This proclaimed word creates our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So our proclamation of Jesus 
is an indispensable component of God's saving actions. Here is proclamation from Paul's letter to the Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteous that come from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith, do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend to the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that the Lord Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord over all, and is generous to all who call upon him. For Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Here ends the reading. The Gospel for this 11th Sunday after Pentecost comes from Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning with the 22nd verse. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind... Peter became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. I have to admit that most of my sermons on this story, most of them have focused on Peter and what Peter is up to in this story. He's such an interesting fellow, that Peter. I I highlighted in this case his willingness to risk and to get out of the boat. But I don't know. Life in general these days feels pretty risky. And so I'm feeling particularly risk adverse these days. Just like the disciples in the boat experiencing the storm, trying to get themselves out of the chaos they are in. I'm not really interested in getting out of the boat. There are days I feel like I'm just trying to navigate the storm because our times feel pretty chaotic these days. Life can feel unsettled 
and seeing the change in our institutions. There's changes in healthcare and changes in our political system and in our public schools and of course in our religious institutions. I don't know. The times we live in are so very different, so uncertain, sometimes feeling chaotic. I'm not really interested in getting out of the boat. One guarantee in life is its uncertainty. I mean, perhaps you are feeling unsettled and a bit chaotic too in your personal life. Probably all of us know this feeling, days when we feel we absolutely have it all together. And then in the next instant, it's like the floor has dropped out from under our feet and we have no idea what our next move is. I mean, who of us have not gone from walking on the water to drowning in the depths? Whose life? has never had times of chaos and uncertainty. I mean, Peter's experience on the water, it's not unlike the first reading with Elijah. This prophet Elijah, who went from victory on Mount Carmel to hiding out in a cave because his life was in danger. So, I don't particularly feel like preaching about Peter today, this guy, I don't know, who was maybe testing to see if Jesus was the real deal or maybe needing to grandstand and show off his amazing faithfulness to the rest of the boat crew. No, today I'm feeling a little irked at Peter for abandoning the boat and his friends leaving his oar during a storm and thus putting his friend's lives at risk. So, no, no Peter today. And whether you are feeling unsettled or that life is chaotic today, I want to focus on Jesus in this story. But before we dive into what into that, I, I want to share with you a few Bible pro tips that hopefully will shed a little light on this story. First, when reading your Bibles or hearing the Word of God proclaimed, if the story includes water, and specifically the sea, it's frequently an image in our Bibles for chaos. Certainly in this case, this storm on the sea, it's chaotic. And often in our Bibles, this crossing of the sea is a metaphor for entering into something new, a new situation. I mean, think about God's people when they escaped slavery in Egypt and they cross the Red Sea. Second pro tip, it's also not surprising to learn that the boat was an early symbol of the church. In fact, many of our churches are designed to resemble an upside down boat, the church. Now, I have only been at Prince of Peace a few months, but I have no doubt, like every church, Prince of Peace is different following the pandemic. And like other churches, there are times we look at that and we get afraid, at least unsettled, because the church is not the way we remembered it. It's so very different from church in the past. And at Prince of Peace, we add on to that because we are entering a new time when you will begin looking for a new lead pastor who without a doubt will bring new things and new ways. 
So what can we learn from Jesus in this story and what happened on the sea in this boat? So one thing I thought about this week, one thing to learn from this story is perhaps stay in the boat. During this time of uncertainty, it's best we stick together. We need to gather as church because we need the shelter of each other to weather the storm. And here at church in this gathering, when we hear the word of God, when we receive the meal and receive this blessing of fellowship, it unites us. The Holy Spirit moves in this place at that time. It strengthens our faith for the storms in our life and for life outside of the boat. So stick with the boat. But there's also this. Unlike Peter, keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is our focus. Because even when Peter falters, Jesus reaches out and pulls Peter to safety. And then Jesus climbs aboard that boat in the midst of those exhausted and frightened followers and the wind dies down, the sea is calmed, and everyone, everyone knows that Jesus is God's own son. They bow to this truth with body, mind, heart, and soul. They bow to this life-saving truth. Jesus is here in our midst, and he is Lord. Here at Prince of Peace, in this time that is unsettled, let's stick together in the boat and let us focus on Jesus. Let us keep our eyes as well as our mind and our heart on him. Let's refrain from that temptation to look back at what once was or to bathe in nostalgia because I promise you this, Jesus is ushering us into something new. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus and what he is preparing new for this place, where he is leading and how we might follow. Let us pray. Gracious God, we gather here in this boat to offer you praise and thanksgiving for your unfailing love and faithfulness shown most clearly through Jesus. Open our eyes to recognize you here among us. Help us to take heart in order to meet you and confidence to follow where you lead. And as we prepare for this new and unknown time at Prince of Peace, we pray, Lord, that you continue to be with the pastor that you are already forming to lead this place into a new time. For you are our God, and we are your people, called by your name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now, may the light of God shine on you, May the Lord bless you and keep you this week. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>